Hello and welcome to Warwick iCast. This week, how a team of engineers is using artificial snot to improve the performance of electronic noses. But first, University of Warwick's Dr Boris Ganziger has enlisted the help of amateur astronomers from all over the world to help monitor one of the fastest spinning white dwarf stars ever found, as Leslie Carr now reports. In the words of Captain Kirk, space is the final frontier. Now, unlike the Enterprise, we as yet can't go very far into it. But we can observe the phenomenal changes that take place up to 10 billion light years away from our planet. At the forefront of astronomical observation is the University of Warwick's Department of Physics, where, two years ago, they announced an astonishing discovery. It's called HS 2331, and it's one of the fastest spinning white dwarf stars ever found. We started to follow it up with various telescopes in different places, and then realized that we had found a real gem, because this star is a very small, very short period system. The two stars go around each other every 80 minutes, and the white dwarf is pulsating, so it gets brighter and dimmer every five minutes. And in addition, we found that it's rotating very rapidly, it's rotating once every minute. And so this makes it one of the most complex of these systems that we know of. Now in addition, what we found about this system makes us expect that it will brighten at some point by a factor of several thousands. And then it will be bright enough that people with binoculars can see it. Professor Gensiker wants no chance of missing the star's explosion. So he's recruited a team of top amateur astronomers from across the world. Between them, they're monitoring HS 2331, watching for those vital early warning signs. I have engaged in collaboration with amateur astronomers who, I mean, they should be really called semi-professional astronomers because they have got the similar equipment as we have just downscale. They've got electronic cameras and good telescopes and so on. And they've got all the time they need So they can, every time it's clear, they can go out and they can look at our stars and tell us whether they're still faint or whether they're on the rise to the outburst that we predict. And if that happens, then we can swing some of the big telescopes where we have time allocated for that special event to this star and study it in all the details. You obviously know what what phase the star is in from the observations that you've made the night before. So if you go to a particular field uh, and, and you look and you can see the star very faintly where you couldn't see it the night before, then the chances are that that star is then becoming active and then it's time to alert other astronomers to this. Is your heart in your mouth? Sometimes it can be, yeah, especially if you've been looking at a star for many, many years or where a star should be for many, many years and you haven't seen it. Uh, and then all of a sudden you go out one night and you point the telescope to the star and there it is. It takes you a couple of seconds to recover. The thing to do is to, is to move the telescope and then move it back to the field just to make sure that you've got the, ident- the identification right. Um, And then, of course, you realise that something's happened and uh, you just alert the rest of the astronomical community. There's time set aside for special events like that. And if we are alerted, then we would call the people at the the observatory and tell them, please stop whatever you are doing and swing the telescope to that star and start to record its outburst and get us all the data you can get. HS 2331 is 260 light years away, so Gary is looking at the star as it was in the 1740s, when George II was king and Beethoven was a toddler. The actual rise from its really faint state at the moment to the brightest it will get is only a few days. So if somebody, some amateur, gets it on the rise, it will take only two days, maybe three days, until it reaches the maximum brightness. And then it will stay bright for a couple of weeks, maybe a few months, and then it will start slowly to fade away again. So if we want to understand the system, an important thing is to catch it as early on the rise to this outburst as possible. It will be terribly exciting, and it will just override whatever else I'm doing at that moment. So if that moment comes, it will be a couple of very busy days at the beginning for me, and then we will have to sort out the follow-up observations throughout the whole outburst and the return to, into the quiescent level afterwards. It'll feel fantastic. Um, I just hope it's me. Um, uh, if I go out one night and I see the star a magnitude or maybe two magnitudes brighter than what it normally is, uh, the first thing I'll do will we'll call Boris um, or send him an email and then I will send out a message to astronomers around the world saying that this star is active. Uh, and from that point onwards, 
Um, there'll be sort of large telescopes on Earth pointing at it, maybe one or two satellites, to try and get as much data as we can about this pretty unique star. Electronic noses have been used in manufacturing for many years, but unlike the human nose, they're limited as to the amount of smells that they can detect. Now researchers at the universities of Warwick and Leicester have created an artificial mucus coating that significantly improves the sensors on these so-called e-noses. Professor Julian Gardner explains more. Electronic nose is, uh, is an instrument that's been developed here at Warwick University and it consists of an array of sensors and attached to those sensors is a pattern recognition system and we use this to mimic the human sense of smell. Here we have kind of what we would see as more of a traditional electronic nose. We have a series of different types of chemical sensors. Now these chemical sensors respond to different types of uh, molecules or odours within the atmosphere. And what a normal electronic nose does is that it um, looks at all these multiple components and each sensor responds to a group of these. So they're not specifically tuned to, for example, one chemical, but a group of chemicals. What we've done here is we've created kind of a traditional electronic nose to begin with. Onto this we've put a series of chemical uh, coatings. So here we have 80 chemical coatings with varying different tunabilities. Now these sensor coatings are actually uh, a rubber which have been mixed with carbon black. Now what this happens is that a rubber is insulating and the carbon black allows the polymer to conduct. So it gives you a path for conduction. And when you uh, put an odour across here, the polymer actually swells, so it just enlarges. And the conduction path through the material changes because these carbon balls move. Now what we've done that's special is we've added this micro package. We've created a package which has this mucus layer within it. And so we fabricated this um, out of plastic using this machine uh, and then coated it after we've built it with a layer of kind of polymer. Um, it's clear, not green, but it's a similar thing. What this mucus layer does is, if you can imagine in the morning you go and smell some coffee, you, you can tell that it's coffee. And what your human nose does and this nose does is that as that coffee smell goes into your nose, the, the mucus layer here and there separates out the different chemical components. This is our uh, microsterilithography equipment, and we use these to fabricate micropackets such as this. If we wanted to create an object, first what we do is we create or draw a 3D CAD file of this object. Once we've created that, we send it to the machine, and the machine slices that 3D object into a series of 2D layers. So if you were going to make something like uh, the Eiffel Tower, you would draw the Eiffel Tower, and then you would slice it into a series of 2D layers and build each of these layers one after another. The machine works on a process called photopolymerization. So um, inside here is, simply put, an overhead projector, a posh overhead projector. And it takes one of those 2D images and shines it upwards from the base of the machine. Now, a layer of this red resin is trapped between this, which is the build platform, and this, the base platform. And as the light comes up, it cures a layer of this resin. And this is one of the reasons why this room is yellow. Um, the uh, frequency of light which performs this process is basically a blue, a deep blue. And so what we've done here is we've cut all the blue out of the room, so when we're taking parts in and out of the machine, it doesn't cure the resin. So if, when you're trying to do really fine detail, you need to keep the blue light out as much as possible. So this kind of 2D build process just is repeated again and again and again until the part basically comes out of the goo. When you give an odour to one of these systems, all you get is a series of uh, sensor responses, which is we call a spatial response, and we get a temporal response, which is a delay. So the sensors responding to these kind of odour pulses as they come along. So what we then have to do is take this data. I mean, for example, here we have 80 sensors and a test might last five minutes. So you'll have a huge amount of data and we have to convert that into something that we can teach a computer. So normally we have a program called a, like a neural network and we teach it to understand or recognise these different responses to a series of different odours. So you might train it on five or six different chemicals, milk, banana, orange juice, etc. And you would look at the response and the temporal delay. And then when the sensor array was uh, given the same odour again, it's learnt it. So the computer would say, ah, oh, yes, this is orange. One of the problems with, or has been with electronics nose, is its sensitive or selectivity. So it struggled to detect or separate out two different chemicals within it. So if you mixed orange and banana, say, it would, be, it would struggle to separate the two. And this is really where this micro package comes in. So by separating out these chemical odours as they travel along the nose, you've got more chance of being able to uh, separate out two different or very similar components 
and also see very low concentration of one smell in a background odour of very large smell. At the moment, the main uses will be things like uh, food, industry, beverages, those kind of things, um, freshness of fish, that kind of thing, but also things like environmental monitoring. So you can use it for, uh, we've used it for looking at blue-green algae, those kind of issues. And what we've been working on in the last five years is to develop very low-cost technology for handheld electronic noses, electronic noses that go into telephones, mobile phones, rather than great big desktop instruments. Working with Siemens, and Siemens quite interested in this, we could diagnose illness perhaps from breath analysis. So the idea is that you could breathe into your phone that had an electronic nose and it would classify what sort of bacterial infection you got and then you could know what sort of prescription you need. If you want to find out more about engineering research here at the University of Warwick, then go to warwick.ac.uk. That's all for this week. Until next time, goodbye.